Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you, and for being here. And welcome, everyone, to the weekly Black Health Trust program. My name is Michelle, and I'm coming to you from Los Angeles. And I'm your host for today. Today's discussion will be moderated by the distinguished Dr. Randall Maxey, Chief Medical Officer of Advanced Community Medical Care Corporation here in LA. The mission of the Black Health Trust is to provide credible insights from our community health experts to best serve our communities of color with a coalition of leading and longstanding Black medical professionals across a diverse spectrum of disciplines to offer unvarnished opinions and insights into our physical and mental health during these challenging times. Before we begin the program, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items and announcements. Number one, please be advised that this video conference is live and will be recorded on different public pl pl platforms, excuse me, such as Facebook Live, and that participation on this call is completely voluntary. If you choose to participate on this call, and we're glad that you do, um, and prefer not to have your image and likeness displayed, there are visual and audio settings on your device that you can choose to block um, your picture and mute your voice at any time. So speaking of mute, everyone's audio is being muted by our technician initially. We ask that you remain muted until the host or facilitator asks you to contribute in order to minimize the distraction of background noise. So check and make sure your device is on mute at all times until called on to speak. And then once again, place your device back on mute when you're done speaking. Thank you for that. So a little chat room etiquette. I'm gonna put a little notice in there as well to remind you, but please limit your questions to two questions per topic being addressed. And please do not use the forum to advertise or promote your products. Understand that we have a limited amount of time and there may not, may not be sufficient time to get to all the questions during the call, but we do, will do our best. And you can always reach us at um, blackhealthtrust.org with additional follow-up questions. So please note the information communicated on this program is not deemed to be medical or legal advice, and you should always consult your own medical or legal professional for advice pertaining to your particular situation and needs. Black Health Trust needs you to continue bringing our community outstanding programming, critical and timely information. Blackhealthtrust.org needs your support. Please visit the website, blackhealthtrust.org to learn more on how to support, volunteer, donate, and do whatever you can to help us get this information out to even more people. You can also purchase the Black Health Trust or BHT face mask on the site to show your support. So I wanna thank the Black Health Trust steering committee, the administrative assistant and all the people behind the scenes for their time and efforts to make this program possible. We couldn't do it without you and we truly appreciate you. Last, I wanna give a big welcome to all of our distinguished physicians and special guests. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts in advance for your sharing your valuable time, information, and educated insights with us. We're blessed to have your participation and to know that you care about and support our communities of color. Knowledge is power. So welcome again, everybody, to the Black Health Trust Program. Grab your coffee, tea, get comfortable, lean in. And Dr. Maxey, I invite you to begin moderating the program. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Um, I'm very happy to bring information from the Black Health Trust. This week has been very eventful, as have all the weeks previous. Uh, we do give honor and thanks for the life of the star of Black Panther who passed. He was a, a supreme version of our community and we salute him and we ask that he rest in peace and our prayers go for his family. The total COVID cases in the USA as of yesterday was 5,890,532. The total deaths in the United States was 181, 143,000. Cases in the last seven days were 201,985. Cases per 100,000 population were 1,797. And the calculated deaths per 100,000 population is 55. The reason I'm giving these statistics is that 
this is a real threat. There are many who don't believe that this disease, this pathology, this pandemic is real. It has nothing to do with politics, red or blue. It is worldwide. We have assembled a cadre of distinguished physicians and they will present each of them in their own right is an expert. I would like to introduce them to you. The first speaker is Dr. David Satcher, who is both an MD and a PhD. He obtained his medical degree and his doctor of philosophy degree, his PhD at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, the great and sacred state of Ohio, because I'm from there too. He served as the 16th Surgeon General of the United States from 1998 to 2002. He also served as the director of the CDC and the administrator of the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. He is currently the founding director and senior advisor for the Satcher Health Leadership Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine. The next speaker is Dr. Moro Salafu. He is a tenured professor of medicine and chairman of the Department of Medicine at State University of New York Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. He has done extensive research in vascular biology, chronic kidney disease, and kidney transplants and has served as the past president of the New York Society of Nephrology from 2013 to 2014. And I would also like to introduce a person who is very special to me because I met her when she was 16 and now she's 18, Dr. Barbara Neighbors Stevens, MD, she was a director of pediatric education at Meharry Medical College. She served as chair of the National Medical Association pediatric section and member of the NMA board of trustees. And she is currently the chair and council of the council of medical legislation for the National Medical Association. So we have a, a very good lineup. Uh, I will ask that uh, the speakers um, use their slides. Uh, we will save questions until uh, they have finished their individual presentations. We can put questions in the chat box and uh, we can ask questions of the individual speakers and then I'll ask them to participate in a general round robin of discussion. The distinguished Dr. David Satcher We'd be honored if you would start our discussion. Let, let me say that I'm honored to be able to join you. I commend you on this very impressive program. Uh, bring you greetings from right here at the Morehouse School of Medicine. In fact, even though I'm retired, I'm still in the same office as I speak to you. But anyway, um, I wanted to uh, use my five to seven minutes uh, wisely. So let me just give you a little background. Uh, the, the study that I'm commenting on today actually started when I was director of the CDC. And uh, I was approached by some of the members of the staff there about an opportunity which they thought we had to make inroads into the uh, Native American population relative to diabetes. And uh, 
So we decided to meet with uh, Congressman Newt Gingrichs. We uh, were in his district. I had never met him at that time. And so we had a meeting with him and uh, he responded very enthusiastically. And I found out later that it was because he had people in his family with diabetes. And I was, we were asking for money to see if we could make some inroads into diabetes in the Native American population in this country. We were actually asking for $200 million. And um, ultimately he helped us to get that. Having said that, um, the bottom line is that we were able to carry out a program that went on for several years. In fact, it was only in the last two years that the uh, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly published uh, some results from that study. And uh, if, you, if I could get the slides. And basically, we attacked Let's do the next one. But we dealt with uh, lifestyle and uh, social determinants of health and, uh, and several other things. But to make a long story short, uh, when this was published a little over two years ago, as you can see, uh, we looked at kidney failure from diabetes in Native Americans and basically saw dramatic progress, mainly based on an intervention related to physical activity, diet, and things like that, as well as one medication a day. And um, hopefully this comes through fairly clearly, but you can see the dramatic drop uh, in uh, kidney failure from diabetes in Native Americans uh, over that period of time. I left the CDC, as some of you remember, in 1998 when I became Surgeon General. But we had started uh, this project and it went on really up until, I guess in a way it's going on now, but the major part of it went on until two years ago. And you can see how dramatically uh, renal failure uh, decreased in Native Americans. Um, if you just look at the black, the, uh, the blue line, which is for the black population, then you can see that the uh, Native American uh, renal failure rate dropped dramatically. It dropped just in just about every group. Uh, I'll, I won't say any more about that, but I'll be happy to answer any questions about it. It's a very aggressive, uh, comprehensive project on several reservations. Uh, to the left, of course, um, uh, we start off, uh, I guess I should have said that first, but we start off by looking at the situation the way it was before in terms of diabetes. Now, since 2013, diabetes has decreased in American Indians. So not just the renal failure, but diabetes itself. And the reason I present this is that it's a very encouraging story about what we can do. A lot of things we're trying to do as a part of this uh, strategy for eliminating disparities in health. This is a very positive example of what was done and the impact that it had on disparities in health. Um, this was obviously easier to do among, among Native Americans because of the fact that uh, many of them live on reservations. It was easier to implement a project uh, targeting uh, people on reservation than if we were to target the black population in which we'd have to implement it all over the country. Ultimately, we've got to do that, but we wanted to start by showing what could be done. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go on to the next slide. And I'm not changing the subject, but some of you remember that back in 2005, uh, soon after I had gotten back here from Washington, uh, we did a project. Um, uh, I, I, come, I came back to develop the National Center for Primary Care. And uh, we did a project in which we looked at 
um, disparities. And the, the title of the paper that we reported it on in health affairs was what if we were equal? And basically we were looking at excess deaths that occurred that should not occur if we had equal access to, in terms of health care, but also if we had equal uh, participation and physical activity, good nutrition, et cetera. Um, I like this study, I like this slide because um, it has a lot of hope in it. When we started, if you go back to 1960, you can see that uh, black females uh, in 1960 had the greatest mortality ratio. And it was not until 1980 that those land cro lines crossed and black males because of cocaine and several other things going on at that time, many black males went to prison, families were, were separated. And so starting in 1980, the uh, mortality ratio for black males rose to the top and continued to go up until 1990. And then, uh, and that's, that still exists, um, even things like college attendance and graduation Black females far outnumber black males. But that was directly related to the other things that I mentioned, incarceration, as well as um, those other things. Uh, I'm going to stop there because I know I've gone over already. So uh, I know you have a lot of, uh, I have seen the questions. Do you want me to deal with them now or wait? Um, well, uh, first, first thing I want to say, we thank you. You being a full professor, I was taught that we had to give the full professor any amount of time that he needed. So oh, you don't oh, have to look out. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I know you're not a preacher, but uh, if you have anything you need to add on to that, feel free, and we will deal with some of the questions. Yeah. Uh, you you want to just take them randomly? Uh... Yes, uh, let me start off by saying, first of all, uh, I have never felt so safe as when there was a trusted director of the CDC and a trusted Surgeon General. Uh, I feel a bit uh, concerned about the health statistics, the testing, uh, the legitimacy of information that we're being provided now, and I'm wondering if you can comment on the current situation, understanding that uh, just recently, the standards uh, given to us for deciding who gets tested under what circumstances have changed. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, to be honest with you, I'm embarrassed by that. Uh, along with three other former directors of the CDC, we did an op-ed in the Washington Post about two months ago, in which we uh, talked about the danger of uh, political interference in the work of the CDC. But uh, I'm convinced that what you're hearing from the CDC now in terms of testing guidelines and things are direct results of political interference. Uh, and so it's getting to the point where people are not trusting uh, what they get from the CDC the way they used to. It used to be one of the most trusted agencies in the country, but things have sort of fallen apart up there in that sense. Okay. Um, Michelle, are there any questions in the chat box yet? Pertaining to the presentation, uh, there was one question. Can this protocol be implemented in underserved populations throughout the US? Yeah, but not as easily. Uh, you know, obviously when people are living together on reservations, it's easier to implement a project related to regular physical activity and good nutrition, things like that. So it was easier to implement this on reservations than it would be, for example, to implement it in the black community where you don't have the same kind of connectedness. So it is possible to do it, but not as easy. Thank you, Dr. Satcher. That's it for the chat room for the moment in terms of the presentation, but we'll probably get to this other question later. We sent him a number of questions. Uh, Dr. Satcher, why don't you pick out 
several of those questions you would like to address. Okay, I think oh, Dr. Dr. Faggot had his hand up, so. Um, Dr. Excuse Faggot, can you unmute Dr. Faggot? Simon, can you unmute Dr. Walter Faggot? Walter. Yes, I sent him the request. He has to click his pop-up. There he is. Okay. There he was. He's still can muted. Until we get him can unmuted, you, uh, Dr. Can Satchel. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, yes we, we can. can. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Satchel. So good to see you. Uh, big you. question. That was a significant impact uh, on the Native American population. Did it involve uh, NIDDK, other agencies? How did you get such a dramatic drop uh, in the Native American population uh, as shown in your graph? And uh, can that be uh, replicated uh, in the African American population? Well, first, you have to realize there were a lot of years involved. Uh, <laughs> this project started in 1996 when I was still director of the CDC. And this report that um, where um, we received the results that I showed, I believe it was in 2013. So you're talking about almost um, 20 years um, during that time, but you can do a lot in 20 years or you can do nothing. And I think what we were trying to show was that if we get the support we need to make changes, for example, in the black community, it's not going to be a short term thing because this problem didn't develop over a short period of time. So, but what's encouraging to me about that study is that for the results that we received after about 15 years. Um, in fact, the last director of the CDC, Tom Frieden, and whom some of you know, he worked in New York City before, but uh, he wrote a an article about these findings. And it's really interesting when you, a lot of time what happened is if there's one director say 20 years ago, then there are five more directors before something like this happened. Nobody follows up. Nobody, nobody follows up to see. Yeah. So I'm very pleased that the, with the consistency of this intervention. Uh, Dr. Satchel, uh, being our Surgeon General, in my mind, still. Thank you. What would you tell our listening audience who could be as many as seven to 10,000 people in our communities all over, what they should be doing to protect themselves, what they should desire in terms of being tested? What are your directions and advice for our communities of color? Well, um, I'll try to make this brief. Number one, COVID-19 is to be taken very seriously. I mean, uh, we've already lost too many people and we continue to lose them. So I think it's really important for people to protect themselves. And, and obviously by now people know that that means uh, wearing a mask uh, just about all the time now, but also social distancing, washing your hands, all of those things are really critical because this is a very dangerous disease. Uh, and, if you, and if you get sick and you don't know what's wrong with you, of course, you need to get checked out because a lot of people are ignoring symptoms up until it's very late. And um, so we've, we've lost a lot of, we've lost a lot of black physician, by the way. I don't know if you're aware of that, but I know here in Atlanta, uh, we've had a lot of black physicians. Most of them were older, but still, uh, you know, they would not have died if, it, if they had not been victims of COVID-19. So it's a very dangerous disease. We need to take it very seriously. Um, uh, old and young as far as that goes, not just the old, older people, but young people too need to take it very seriously. Uh, it does help to maintain your physical conditioning. Uh, so I wanna encourage younger people to take very seriously uh, the admonition to 
to be physically active on a regular basis and to engage in good nutrition. Uh, Cause that also, even though it hasn't been talked about as much, it's very clear that that also reduce, reduces your chance of becoming a victim. But basically it's a very dangerous disease and I, I hope we can get a vaccine soon. I'm involved with the whole vaccine thing. And um, I hope that very soon we'll have a vaccine. Right now, I think we should be getting, making sure that we get our immunization for the regular season of flu. Uh, we, don't, we don't need these two things to come together. So I would strongly recommend that people get the flu vaccine as soon as possible. Dr. Satcher, there's been a lot of vaccine hesitancy in our community, in the news, and also from a number of physicians that we have talked to. Uh, I'd really like you to address your perspective on vaccines in general and specifically, and how can we be uh, assured or more assured that when they do come up with the vaccine, it has efficacy? Well, I, I think uh, to answer your last question first, I think um, the vaccine trials are being carried out in such a way that it should offer some assurance of safety and efficacy. Um, now, um, I know people have a lot of doubts about this and you have a right to, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I know what's going on in this country and I know why we have all, a lot of rights to, uh, a lot of reasons to be skeptical about these experiments. And of course, you just go back to uh, the Tuskegee syphilis study. One of the first things I did when I became director of the CDC, as some of you remember, was to receive a report from a very important uh, commission. I think a hundred people served on it. And that was a commission that recommended that President Clinton apologize for the Tuskegee study. and. Uh, and so as soon as I got the report, I called Washington and he, uh, you know, he agreed right away. And, but when he, uh, when he did the apology, he did much more than that. Um, he made a commitment that there would be no federally funded programs uh, in the black community unless the black community was involved in those programs. Uh, and I won't go as far as to say that everything he promised has been done, but I think it, it laid the groundwork for a lot of progress in terms of uh, these relationships. And yet people still have a lot of doubts. Uh, however, I think um, when the vaccine is available with the necessary assurances about what happened during the trials of phase one, phase two, phase three trials, I think many more people will, will get it than not get it because too many people are dying from COVID-19. So uh, my guess is that a lot of people are gonna say yes to the vaccine, but if it's presented the right way in such a way that people can feel confident, you know, that it's been appropriately um, tested, it's gone through the appropriate phases. Now you may say, well, how can you go from phase one to phase three in a few months? Uh, you can do it because we've decided to invest a lot of money to close those gaps. Whereas if we were not investing that kind of money, it would take much longer. So um, it's, a, it's a difficult situation, but I think there's hope. And unfortunately, uh, this country has a reputation. That was what Clinton apologized for. And not everything that was promised on that day, May 16th, 1997, not everything has been carried out. So that's the other problem that we face. And the last question I have, uh, there's something called a challenge study or a challenge test where a live uh, agent of virus is given. Uh, but to my understanding, uh, there needs to be a safety valve or a, a cure or something that can save that person if the vaccine doesn't work. Um, I understand we don't have that yet. How would we go about that? And I don't know if Dr. Motley is on, he may have an, 
in addition to that question, but what exactly is a challenge test? And what would we do if that is done and there still doesn't exist a, um, a, re a remedy for that? Well, um, again, I, I think in, in, in these studies that are going on now as we speak, uh, there, there is a safety valve. Um, it's not perfect, it's not 100%. And therefore, uh, people still have uh, distrust about the system. Uh, what I, you saw what happened the other day, of course, when the head of the FDA was giving um, his assurance, and, and the FDA is the ultimate agency when it comes to um, these trials and things. And the fact that the head of the FDA made a statement that was totally false doesn't really help at all in terms of people's confidence. So we're dealing with two things here. We're dealing with history, and certainly history is not, has not been on our side. And we're also dealing with uh, integrity on the part of leadership, starting with the White House. Uh, we have some serious problems uh, when it comes to that. So it's not gonna be easy any, any way you look at it. I don't think anybody can give assurances that it's gonna be easy because uh, there's a lot of, lot of distrust right now in this country when it comes to leadership, especially starting with the White House. Well, I thank you very much, Dr. Satcher, for being with us. I hope you can stay around for further questions and discussion. I'd like to introduce the distinguished Dr. Moro Salafu, who is the Chief of Medicine at State University of New York Downstate Medical Center. That happens to be where I did my subspecialty training a uh, hundred years ago. <laughs> I had the uh, honor of meeting Dr. Salafu a number of years ago. I'm extremely impressed uh, by his intellectual accomplishments. And I'd like to invite him to take <clears throat> Dr. Salafu. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Maxi. And uh, thank you to Dr. Sacha for a wonderful discussion. Uh, both of you have been uh, leaders in our fields, in medicine, and uh, have been uh, models for some of us growing in the academic world. So thank you and nice uh, talking to you again. Um, <clears throat> my uh, job today is to uh, talk about a subject. Would you be able to project my presentation or I should project it myself? It'd be better if you could do it, sir. Okay, so I can share my screen? Yes. Okay, so one second. All right, this is my screen. Okay, good. All right, so uh, my job today is to discuss a very important topic in medicine. Um, and we don't really cover this a lot. And in five to seven minutes, it's, uh, it's gonna be hard to cover the whole thing, but I will try to summarize some of the very important things around implicit bias, stereotypes, and uncertainty in healthcare. And I think you're a full professor. Yes, I'm a full professor, yes, yes. There you go. You got some leeway. <laughs> okay, no problem. Uh, so, um, so I am at SUNY Downstate in Brooklyn, SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University in Brooklyn, as he said, and uh, I also direct the, uh, the Health Disparities Center. So even though I'm a kidney specialist, I have you know, been working in health disparities for a long time now, over 20 years. So I find that the health disparities topics actually are broader, it actually impact a lot more than the narrow subspecialty uh, talks. That is why I'm having this talk with you the, uh, this afternoon and hopefully we can have a very nice discussion following that. All right, so why is this important? Um, it is important because somewhere around 2000, and that was when uh, Dr. Sacha was uh, uh, the Surgeon General at, around the same time, the uh, Institute of Medicine at the time, uh, the Institute of Medicine is now called the uh, National Academy of Medicine. But at that time, they came up with a report uh, called the Unequal Access. Uh, and they finally defined what we meant by health disparities. 
So if you say there's disparity, there has to be a way to measure it qualitatively. So let's, let's, let's figure out how to measure that qualitatively. qualitatively. So if you take this bar here as non-minority population, this bar here as the minority population, and then you measure the quality of healthcare in terms of qualitative analysis, you can simply say, okay, non-minority populations are getting a higher level of uh, quality of care than minority populations. This has been documented several times in many studies, and we don't have to go into those ones, but we just want to figure out where it is coming from. Where is that disparity coming from? Is the difference due to clinical appropriateness and need uh, and patient needs or preferences? That is, if a patient says, I don't want to do something, can you force the patient to do it? Maybe not. Uh, so patients have choices and the choices often lead to differences in, uh, in provisions of care and that could actually lead to disparity. Um, there's another box here, which is dealing with the health system. Uh, the healthcare system is very, very complicated. Uh, the way we provide healthcare in hospitals and primary care settings and insurance companies and uh, pharmaceutical companies is just a complex system that is very difficult to navigate. And sometimes minority populations, especially uh, African-American and black populations have hard time navigating that healthcare system. And that could be a problem in terms of provision of care and producing health disparities. Then there's the last box, which is what I'm addressing today. This last box deals with discrimination in general, right? Uh, and that has to do with how healthcare is provided based on somebody's perception and somebody doing something based on their perception of another person. The stereotypes and then the clinical uncertainties that come as a result. So the Institute of Medicine at the time said health disparities actually belongs to these two boxes. That is the complexity of the healthcare system and also discrimination. That is what actually drives disparities, not the choices. If I wanna do something, I just do it. If I don't wanna do it, I don't do it. And that should not be counted uh, in terms of health disparities. So let's take one at a time, uh, these issues and discuss them briefly. So discrimination has a historic context. You all know that there's a lot of history around that and that is not the essence of this conversation. But in the context of what I'm describing, uh, it is the difference in the quality of care that we are trying to figure out. So the first one is uncertainty. You have a patient, patient doctor relationship interaction in an office or in the emergency room. Uh, the patient is able to communicate, but not fully. The doctor has to make a decision, but the doctor's decision is not also fully informed by the patient's complaints. So the doctor has to make a decision for the patient. That decision could be influenced by the patient's, uh, you know, in the, the information that the patient actually provided to the doctor. And then the, the doctor has to be forced to make a decision. That is a, an area called clinical uncertainty. In other words, the doctor is making a decision for the patient with, with less information than would ordinarily be if the doctor is making the same, the person of the same ethnic background. So, that introduces disparities. So a, a white person meeting a, a minority person, black African-American, taking an incomplete history and trying to make a decision out of that incomplete history will result into clinical uncertainty and drive the doctor to make a decision that would otherwise not be a decision for that doctor. The second one is stereotypes. The stereotypes describe what people think about artists. What do whites, you know, perceive that's the perception of an African American, right? There are so many adjectives, you know, whatever that is, what is that perception? And some of them could actually be implicit, that is unconscious, that is, you know, there is a certain stereotype of an African American in the person's head that is usually not good, which um, is not uncommon. And then there is the conscious stereotypes that nobody really talks about because. If it is conscious, the person is going to tell you right away and you are going to know about it. So you are going to address it immediately. So the important thing is these implicit unconscious stereotypes where people perceive other people as being something. And that something is usually not a good something. Drug seeking, poor, you know, not falling up, you know, non-compliant. There are just stereotypes that these are ingrained in the DNA of that person and the person doesn't even know it. And that is because of the growing, the well, I mean, the uh, upbringing of that person in a particular system or a particular system of the society that allows that person to have those stereotypes. 
The next one is the bias, right? Bias is now how you actually express those stereotypes. You actually do something about it. So when you have a stereotype about somebody, right? You're prejudiced, basically. Uh, okay, African-American may be in pain, maybe drug seeking, I'm not gonna give paid medication. Or it's a woman, chest pain, maybe uh, it's probably faking, it's probably not true, probably muscle aches and pains. Okay, no need for cardiac evaluation. So bias is the doing based on the stereotypes, okay? And if it is explicit, you would see it right away and you would address it right away. If it is implicit or unconscious, it's very dangerous because that is the part that the people don't even know they're doing. The guy has a stereotype that is implicit, doesn't know about it because of upbringing and growing up and just feeling the way they feel about other people and then actually putting it into clinical practice without knowing it too. So those two things are very dangerous. And so the clinical encounter becomes problematic because it is driving decision-making without even the person being biased knowing about it. That is why we say it's implicit. And we wanna make sure that everybody understands that concept, right? So the implicit bias component is more common when medical decisions are under time pressure, such as in emergency rooms, you come to the emergency room, you're given a story, the doctor, the emergency room doctor has to make a decision on time uh, to get the flow going and may not necessarily get enough history, but already has stereotypes in their head and boom, they will make a decision for you, right? That actually happens. And what do we do as patients? We, over time, begin to mistrust the system. We refuse when we are forced to do something. We say, okay, I don't wanna do it. I'm gonna go home and think about it and come back. That's the reaction. But then at least we have disparities. These are the consequences of implicit bias. Every section of medicine, if you look at the literature, there is always implicit bias around the major diseases, how procedures are provided, colonoscopies and all the various procedures, cancer treatment, cardiovascular disease, HIV AIDS, diabetes, mental illness, uh, pain relief, and so on and so forth, right? There is literature supporting implicit bias where African-Americans and women particularly are disadvantaged. And I'm gonna give just one example because I don't have all the time. So this is very, a very nice example to illustrate the point of impl implicit bias. This was a study in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1999 looking at the effect of race and sex on physicians' recommendations for cardiac catheterization. So very nicely done study, uh, you know, around two national meetings, right? They recruited 720 physicians and, and then created these actors. They are not really sick, they are actors, you know, four black uh, or of black heritage and then four white or of white heritage, right? Uh, and then the script for chest pain. The script was given exactly to these people to act and then say exact same way. They were all videotaped in the same exact way, in the same uniform. And then these 720 people were now uh, asked to review the videos and make recommendations about what is the next step for these patients. And the result is that black, Blacks and women were less likely to be referred for cardiac catheterization. Just look at the video. And the complaint, exact same complaint, but the blacks and women were less likely to be referred. And black men in particular were less likely to be referred. All right, that's a big problem. So uh, the recommendations in general, uh, we want everybody to know about this and then be very, very conscious about, you know, using, you know, stereotypes and implicit bias uh, to impact the care of patients. So this requires patient education and empowerment by physicians. We have to promote consistency and equity of care through use of evidence-based guidelines. And even this too has its own problems because the evidence that we're talking about was derived from the non-minority populations. So it, it is very hard until we have enough participation of uh, uh, minority populations in clinical trials. Uh, we have to support the use of uh, interpretation services where we provide care. We have to promote uh, more underrepresented minorities among the health professions. Right now, there, there are only uh, less than 8% of uh, medical school enrollment is African-American. That is not acceptable in today's world of the United States of America. Less than 8%, right? Of all the doctors practice in the USA are African-American. And so the problem is huge. It's beyond all the things that we are talking about. For patients, I think that we must continue to make them aware of the potential for implicit bias or prejudice. Uh, we have to keep preaching that you might not get the care that you are really required to get, and you have to question every single path through the uh, treatment cycle. 
you have to really ask questions and ask questions and make sure you're right, you're getting the right care. We have to keep promoting that. We must make improvements uh, in the following as well. That is health literacy, making sure that uh, people are able to you know, understand simple things in healthcare. And then the information that we provide to patients are at a level where everybody can read, not that some people can read and some cannot read. Right now, uh, if you go into doctor's offices, the information is so complicated. The information is written as if somebody has finished college level to read that kind of information, right? It should be eighth grade or less in order to have my, uh, most of the population actually uh, benefit from that kind of information. And then health services, uh, hopefully, you know, we can expand health services into minority communities uh, and allow them to receive care where the care, where the patient actually is, not migrating to other communities where they are actually having problems and then creating all these uh, problems with implicit bias. So to summarize, uh, healthcare providers should be made aware of the racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare and the fact that disparities exist often despite the provider's best intentions. And that is the implicit bias. It's very dangerous because the people don't know that that's what is going on because they are already imprinted by the DNA to think like that. So the actions they are doing, they don't even know. That is why this education is so important uh, for people to actually understand what it means and then be more conscious about it as they take care of patients. And of course, all healthcare providers and the patients can benefit from cross-cultural education. I will stop here and then we will start the discussion. So thank you uh, for the uh, invitation. I really appreciate uh, Dr. Maxi for uh, reaching out to me. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Sal, for, uh, for your astute uh, presentation. And it comes to mind, I had a, a desperate phone call a few days ago from a good friend of mine a young lady whose uh, brother was at a major hospital in Detroit, Michigan. Okay. And he had gone in with chest pain. Okay. And they did a cardiac catheterization and determined he needed a triple bypass graft. And she called me, would you call the cardiologist? We call the doctors, they're trying to kill my brother. She was totally paranoid that they were experimenting on him. So this is a bit of the other side yes. of the coin. Yes. That there has been a significant lack of faith. Yes. That oftentimes we rule ourselves out of a life-saving procedure. I'd like you to comment on that. Right. In the light, on one side, we have implicit bias and we may not get the treatment. Yes. And on the other side, we may have such doubt that yeah. we're afraid to get to treatment. How do we address that? Okay, so the, the, yeah, so that's a very good question. I appreciate the question uh, because it's a balance, right? So the historical aspects is what's driving the mistrust. That is the problem. So that aspect is at its peak. In other words, the his, historical aspects have not been resolved. People are still mistrusting the healthcare system our job is, and that's what I do at the Health Disparity Center, go into the community, I educate uh, the patients, and I make sure that uh, people understand that some of these issues that happened in the past, there are actually federal rules and regulations that allows uh, them to be resolved at the research level and at the patient care level to some degree, not 100%, but it's highly, highly improved. So, but the part that we now have to uh, impact is creating that confidence right, creating that um, uh, level of trust in the system. So we are at the peak of mistrust and now we have to create trust along that peak and then lower the, 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 the mistrust, increase the trust. That is a challenge. So, and, and that challenge can only broken through education, uh, like the programs that we have at SUNY Downstate uh, and other health disparity centers across the country and in forums like these. Uh, if you are asking the right questions, if you're asking the right questions and getting the right consultations, and there is never a problem getting a second opinion, and your second opinion, you know, comes to the same decision. Okay, you, they called you, Doctor uh, Maxi. They called you, so you you said, okay, this actually is in your favor. I think that's a good thing, because the person doesn't trust the system. The person has had a second, you know, uh, opinion. The second opinion is from the same ethnic background that says, okay, uh, I think. From the person, from somebody that he actually trusts, seeing that okay, this is actually not a bad thing for you. I think that kind of um, system 
it's actually not a bad way to do it. Uh, the question is, does, does everyone have access to another person to ask questions? Do we even know what second opinion mean? Um, can we refuse care and go home and then come back and get same care? So all those things are variables that we cannot resolve. And, and the only solution really is to, uh, to continue to educate the, uh, the public around, around the subject. Okay, my next question while Michelle lets me know if there's anything in the chat. Uh, I'll make up a case. There's a 65 year old black lady. Yes. Who goes to the doctor because she's had uh, periods of, let's say, syncope, fainting. Yes. Uh, is it a good idea for her to take a relative with her? Should she make up a list of questions? How should she? I'm, I'm afraid so many people come to the doctor. Yes. And especially if the doctor doesn't look like them, they just listen to the doctor, they don't ask any questions. Yes. They don't understand what he's taught. How do we solve that? How do we address that issue? That is under the health literacy I was talking about. We have to improve health literacy in our communities. We have to have programs that actually target health literacy in our communities, right? And the first thing that health literacy will do is to talk about basic health uh, questions, basic health definitions and terminology, allow people to understand what it is. Right. If you are a diabetic, go to see your doctor. What is of concern? If you are hypertensive, simple things, because the simple things are what drives the outcomes. If you are di if you are hypertensive, and you go to see your doctor, what are the key questions that you must ask before you leave the room? If you have kidney disease, and then you have to go to see the doctor, what are the questions? Now, that is assuming that everybody can ask a question. Um, so that now comes to your question, which is. Can we, can we um, create a system where there is uh, somebody going with the patient to see the doctor? Now, that is a very good, a very, very difficult system to create. But it's a good idea, of course, because if you are going to the doctor with somebody who actually has health literacy, the person would help you explain yourself and then help to get the doctor's information back to you. I can't tell the number of times that the patients came to my office. Uh, I see them, I explain everything, and then they step out of the door and they come back, doctor, is that what you meant? And I am a patient guy. I explain to the details. I break it down in so low context that if somebody, you know, leaving the office and coming back and asking the same question, sometimes you feel like it's ridiculous, but it's not. They just are looking at the doctor as if it's some you know, some high level thing. And then they are looking at you and say, wondering how you became a doctor. They are not actually looking at your, your, your words and what you're telling them. And that is also the problem. So uh, to answer your question then, uh, after all this revolution is yes, it's a good idea to actually bring somebody if you can. Um, but more importantly, we have to have a structured systematic approach for health literacy in our community. Okay, and one more question, and Michelle, I'm gonna see if there are any questions. Um, African-Americans or Blacks make up less than 15% of the population in the United States. But I'm led to believe that they make up more than 45% of the population on dialysis or needing transplantation. And I fold into there that somewhere above 25% of those people have end stage renal disease or kidney failure as a result of high blood pressure. Yes. But more than 47% of those people are because of diabetes yes. or some combination thereof. Uh, in relating, I'm gonna make this a little bit complicated. Yes. Why are those figures like that? And how does this relate to the increased proportion of our population that's vulnerable to COVID-19. Wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll try, to, I'll try to make it easy. First of all, it is really wrong. I mean, uh, to have 15% of the population carrying 36 to 45% of the burden of kidney disease is really wrong. I mean, you are right. I'm saying that as a country, we should not accept that. 
there is something fundamentally wrong why African Americans are carrying that burden of disease. There's just a fundamental problem of that. Now, is it genetic? Now, I don't know why it should be the genetic. Is it environmental? Maybe yes. Um, is it because of socioeconomics? But why we're in the United States? The, uh, you know, and everybody's boasting on TV, this is the best country in the world, the, the greatest economy that the world has ever seen. So how can African Americans be carrying that burden uh, three, four times more than the uh, white population? So I think we have to lobby, we have to do what we can do to make sure that we address those issues at the uh, policy level. So policy would address some of these issues more effectively. But coming to the individual level, at the individual level, um, the data shows that you know, African-Americans are 16 times more likely to be hypertensive, four times more likely to be diabetic. That is the problem. So, uh, so our the, the lifestyle, the diet, and I, Dr. Sacha mentioned nutrition uh, when he was giving his talk. Nutrition is really, really crucial. And if you if you trace it back to where you know people live, it's really tough. I'll give an example. In 1929, right, the housing collapse of 1929 created what we call redlining. Okay, where the banks couldn't just loan money to poor people. They couldn't because they were not sure whether you could pay back. So they gave it to people who could pay back. And because they gave it to people who could pay back, who are those people? They, are, they were mostly white and affluent people. A few maybe black, but they were more affluent people. So that created zones around the entire country of red zones that couldn't pay back loans, don't have mortgages, cannot you know, get a you know, credit card, cannot get student loans to send their children to school. It created just these demarcations of zones around the entire country, red. And then the green zones where, you know, people, affluent people, private schools, everything is fine, nice, right? And then you have, you know, whole foods and all that stuff, nice stuff. Then the yellow stuff, which is now in between, the yellow zones, which is in between. So African-Americans ended up being in red zones. So a policy issue created this monster. A policy issue has to solve this monster, right? You cannot use a policy to punish people and not have a policy to address the issue. That's why at the individual level, it's very hard to solve this problem unless we have some policy. And I don't know what that's gonna be and because I'm not a politician, but it has to be solved at the policy because policy is what created the problem where people are segregated permanently. And those locations, no good food, is fast food, is this, is that, is stressful. The allostatic load, we call the stress load is called allostatic. The allostatic load of these communities is just unbelievable. And that was created by policy. So we need policy to solve that problem. Well, thank you. I definitely appreciate your presentation. Uh, Michelle, are there any questions in the chat box for Dr. Salafu? Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Salafu. We do have several questions. Uh, one being, and this is an interesting question, but needs to be addressed, I think. Please speak to the issue of internalized raci racism on the part of black and brown medical staff um, to black and brown patients. White practitioners are not the only ones who offer subpar care when dealing with patients who are not white. Any comment on that? That is very true. That is why I, I uh, you know, in my talk, you realize that I said one group versus other. I didn't use white specifically. It, it, it's, it's how the person is brought up. When you are brought up to have stereotypes, those stereotypes would manifest whether you're black or white. If you're a black person and you are brought up with stereotypes that, oh, by, you know, black people are more likely to, uh, you know, to possess this or the poor or not likely to follow up uh, with, with their care, more likely to be readmitted to the hospital, more likely to do X, Y, Z. If that is what your DNA imprinted upon you in your head as you grew up, is going to manifest in biases and prejudices. So it's both ways, just more on the uh, on the white side in terms of the studies that we, we have shown so far. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, with respect to more on implicit bias and, and unconscious bias, are implicit bias classes routinely taught in medical school or is that something that is taught after the fact, if at all? Well, uh, this is not taught at all in medical schools and then myself and then the Health Disparity Center in Brooklyn. 
uh, we are very aggressive at uh, trying to, uh, you know, get uh, these kinds of topics into the medical curriculum. Um, uh, as a result of the uh, George Floyd issue, there is now this, you know, move to uh, create this um, social justice, uh, with, even within the curriculum, to make sure that we are actually training uh, our young doctors in ways that are going to be, you know, blind. So you don't see race as a part because there's truly no biological differences. What has happened is epigenetic or just environmental differences or just power differences. But biologically, it doesn't seem to be a difference. So, um, but unfortunately, to answer your question specifically, unfortunately, medical schools do not have these topics. And it's critical that medical school curricula have these kinds of topics, yes. You use the big word, yes. epigenetics. Can you break that down just a little bit? Epigenetics means, uh, after you know, uh, after you know, one is born, based on environmental factors, some of the proteins could change a little bit based on uh, what you encounter, and because those proteins could change a little bit, uh, it could actually influence the way you know organs actually function, um, and it, it could be at the protein level, at the gene level, uh, but those are things that you know happen after you actually acquire your DNA after fertilization. The DNA that you get after fertilization is inherited. What you actually get after the DNA has actually uh, fertilization, whatever happens after that is called epigenetics. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I go on to the next question? Yeah. Okay. So again, talking about education in, in realms of uh, our healthcare, our ignorance of the factors that affect our health is reinforced by the poor health curriculum from elementary school up. We don't know how to advocate for ourselves because of the lack of basic understanding of life science. Can the medical profession work with the Department of Education on a curriculum that will empower people of all ages, races, and ethnic groups? Wow, that is, um, that is, that is a very good question, and I like it so much, and that has been my life. Over the last 20 years, that's what I have been working so hard to do uh, locally in Brooklyn. Uh, we're in the schools, we're in the barber shops. Uh, we're in the churches, we're doing everything we can to give information to people to change uh, behavior, right? Mm -hmm. uh, could we have a system uh, where that could be translated to policy? And I say yes. The National Institute of Health, which is the bigger you know, part of the NIH looking at health disparities in general, has all these agenda items uh, to uh, reduce health disparities across the nation. And one of them is actually targeting how we actually uh, you know, provide education to to um, high school students and then uh, to uh, uh, undergrads and grad students. We were one of, the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center was one of the beneficiaries of such a program. We got a $10 million award to actually do exactly that, to train uh, uh, junior high school students and, and, and co uh, college students uh, in terms of health information and behavior change. And we're actually doing that as we speak right now. Now, this is only what we got. But I think that these kinds of programs should be, you know, nationwide, especially in these minority populations, so that people actually get the education from the beginning. You have to catch people from primary school, high school, and then into uh, college in order to influence these kinds of behaviors. And right now, it's not, it's not, um, it's very sporadic. It depends on what grant you have, what resources you have. It's not systemic. That, you know, um, prevention should be systemic. It should be available to every single student who is coming up in the educational system. Yeah, right mm -hmm. along with racial equity education yeah. as well. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Along Thank, the same. You. Exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, Michelle, I'd like to, before we go to our next speaker, and invite Dr. Salafu and Dr. Satcher to stay for a round of questioning. I'd like to recognize Ansel Lau uh, to talk about how we get support uh, to continue these sessions. And then I would go to our other speaker. Thank you, Dr. Maxey. Welcome everyone to the Black Health Trust program for today. I'm a proud member of the Black Health Trust family. Sorry, I forgot to turn on my camera. <laughs> I'm a proud member of the Black Health Trust family whose mission is to provide credible information and insight from our community health experts. And we are so grateful for the numerous health professionals that have donated their time and their expertise to our dynamic Sunday programs. Our goal is to inform and help people of color become and stay healthy. And the continued success of our efforts 
is dependent on you. Please consider a modest donation uh, for our organization to take care of the cost for the putting on this Sunday program. You can visit us at blackhealthtrust.org where you'll find a donation box and we look forward to your generous support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we have uh, started this program. We started reaching uh, 30 to 50 people on the Zoom call. It morphed into being streamed on Facebook Live and LinkedIn and other platforms. And we've reached as many as 10,000 people on a call. And uh, in addition, we post all of these uh, talks on our website at blackhealthtrust.org. And so people can go back and look at them for uh, days and weeks and months later. Uh, we're talking mostly nowadays about uh, COVID-19, but it is our intent to continue to talk about things that affect uh, our people of color in general. And we want you to feel free to invite others uh, to this platform as we provide uh, medical and health information. It is our intent also, we've had live debate among our health professionals. And uh, we're going to be starting in the next week or so, a channel and a program for health professionals to have uh, true uh, debate about the best treatments, not only for COVID, but best practices among other things that affect our population uh, more. Uh, we've had people volunteer to be a part of our health advisory. Uh, we wanted to create a repository of information uh, going forward that we can be that source. I've recently spoken to the editor of the Journal of the National Medical Association, Dr. Ears Mitchell, and she has agreed to assist us in that uh, manner so that we can create something that will work along with the National Medical Association and other professional organizations, the Association of Black Cardiology, Black Cardiologists and others that we can be a service to people of color. So we're going to be expanding and we invite your uh, participation in that. Uh, our next speaker, uh, I've known since I was a student myself. I was a, a grubby graduate student at Howard University uh, working on my PhD in a dog lab. And this young student who was absolutely brilliant uh, was assigned to me as, as a, uh, to help train. And we spent evenings and Saturdays while in fact, there was a lot of burning going on because this was right after Martin Luther King got assassinated. But she stuck with me. It so happened that her grandfather was a president of Howard University, uh, Dr. James Neighbor. And in addition, he was also the associate of Thurgood Marshall, who created the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Bill. So I have special pleasure of inviting Dr. Barbara Nabert Stevens, pediatrician, to take the floor. Thank you so much, Dr. Maxey. Now it is asking me to do stuff that it didn't ask before. There we go. I am, uh, I was uh, surprised and uh, but very eager to answer the call um, to participate in this program. The issue of getting accurate information disseminated into our community is an issue that is um, very important to me. And whatever I can do to help facilitate that, I'm always happy to do. 
And being a pediatrician um, and a parent and a grandparent, um, of course, I am very concerned about what's going on with our children in this country uh, in general, but in particular, going back to school. And so what I want to spend a few minutes with you today discussing is what about school? I want to just quickly share a couple of pieces of really recent information. Uh, I think without exception, all of these uh, papers that I am going to reference have all been published since the first week of August. Uh, we all know that there's a lot of learning left to be done about COVID. And so it's possible that some of the things, and it is, it's not just possible, it is true that some of the things we thought we knew back in March and April are turning out to be not necessarily the case. And there hasn't been up until recently, a lot of research uh, performed around um, the impact of COVID in children because in fact, uh, the uh, number of COVID identified known, you almost always have to say that because this the high level of suspicion, there's a lot out there we don't know, it hasn't been documented. But with the uh, shutdown back in March and the closing of schools, kids were, um, pretty much staying around the house. And so one of the thoughts is that there wasn't necessarily as much COVID infection going on in the kids because they weren't out and about. But since the end of July, um, especially here in the South, a lot of the schools have started to open and um, some not so surprising, but definitely sad and ultimately preventable um, situations have arisen. And, you know, as this is the story is just so rapidly evolving. Last night, I thought I had finished this, my slides, and I didn't add this. I thought I could just speak to it. They announced on the news that over 1,200 students at University of Alabama uh, in Tuscaloosa have turned up positive in less than two weeks. They started 10 days ago, well, 11 days ago now, and they've already um, unfortunately identified over 1,200 cases. So despite what is being said uh, by politicians and others, um, we need to pay a lot more attention to COVID and children. Not only because COVID, although it's usually a mild disease in children, it's not always a mild disease. My suspicion is the more cases of COVID we have, the more uh, serious um, cases of COVID will be identified and the number of um, the uh, post-COVID inflammatory condition that Dr. Faggett spoke about last week uh, will be identified. But um, quickly, um, the, and, oh, and the other issue that is not just related to the pediatric data, it's hard to get your hands on a lot of data for um, reasons that we can all speculate on. There, there have been efforts to perhaps not, to not make data as available as uh, you would like as a Floridian, I, I can tell you that's been quite the, the uh, topic uh, in terms of the availability of data, but it's not just Florida. Uh, there is really no good national registry of data around children, um, especially when you try to add on the layer of um, uh, race, uh, from the, the racial cat, um, cal categories. So it, so the, the people at children's at the Children's Hospital Association and American Academy of Pediatrics, when added 
at another way, they went after all of the county data and large metropolitan area data that they could get their hands on. And using that data, um, they looked over the two week period of August 6th to August 20th, during which again, in the South, several school districts had um, opened up and they were able to identify that there was a 21% increase in COVID cases in children just in that two week period. Another um, point that they uh, identified was that of the 442,785 COVID, pediatric COVID cases that had been reported, uh, this represented 9.3% of all the cases in the United States. Bring this up again to emphasize the fact that children do get COVID, but also to try to counteract some of the state public statements that have been made about how insignificant COVID is in children. Uh, these cases in children account for anywhere from 0.5 to 5.3% of all of the hospitalizations for COVID in this country. And unfortunately, although they, and it is unfortunate that children have died, fortunately, um, so far, they only account for 0.4% of all the COVID deaths reported in this country. But let me say that this is as of August 20th. And although I tried to get later data, I could not get any later data. The prevalence of COVID among asymptomatic children has been demonstrated to roughly reflect the confirmed local cases in a general population. This was reported just last week. Now, this is really important because first of all, COVID is more often than not, not symptomatic in children. But when you do have the opportunity to test asymptomatic, asymptomatic children, you find that their infection rate is uh, about the same as the general infection rate reported for a given uh, locality. This is really important for parents because you don't want to make your decision about whether or not your child is going to go back to school based on information in Los Angeles and you live in Chicago, you want to base your decision on that information that is um, in the locality relevant, reported for the locality that you live. The other really important thing I just, I'm gonna be saying it over and over again is the amount of disease and infection present in children is asymptomatic more often than not. And that is going to complicate things in terms of trying to um, I control infection and identify children that should not be in school, should um, your school, first of all, should your school system open? And secondly, whether or not your child is um, put in that situation. Uh, it has been said publicly that children uh, don't have a lot of, of the virus. In fact, it has been documented as of uh, publication on August 19th that children, in fact, carry a very high viral load, whether they have symptoms or not, which means that as they move around, they can be spreading COVID. This is uh, probably of the um, most um, important thing that I want to get out because I don't, I don't remember hearing a lot of discussion about this uh, in the lay press. But as a matter of fact, it has been documented that just as adults who are African-American or in other minority groups and are in socially economically disadvantaged groups carry a disproportionate burden of COVID. So true, so true is it also of children. So um, that's not surprising, but it should be emphasized as, as parents 
consider whether or not they want to send their children back to school. I might add, it's also important for teachers who uh, are having to make the decision and other school workers and bus drivers, everybody associated with the school community has decisions that they need to make. So this is not all by any stretch of the imagination, the questions that parents need to consider as they go about making their their decision about their child. But I think these are some of the more important ones that will help you uh, seek um, additional or uh, necessary information and may trigger other questions that you may need to pursue answers to as you make your ultimate decision. So again, remember children most of the time are not gonna have symptoms. And if they do have symptoms, they are very nonspecific mild symptoms that could easily be confused with um, allergies or uh, you know any old regular cold. So this whole notion, it has always, uh, it has always bothered me that there has been so much preaching and reliance on taking the temperature, uh, whether you're talking about children or adults. People don't have to have a fever to be actively infected with COVID. And so just because you take somebody's temperature and it's normal does not mean that they are not infected with COVID. And it gives a false sense of security by um, hanging your hat on that kind of protocol. But more, more about that again later. So the first question you wanna ask is, is your child or is anyone in your household uh, a member of the at-risk category for COVID-19 as defined by CDC? And just to um, refresh your memory, those categories include cancer, chronic kidney disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, any kind of immunocompromised state or weakened immune system because of medication or being post transplant or, or any disease that leads to an immunocompromised state such as lupus. Obesity defined as a body mass index over 30. Serious heart conditions such as heart failure or you know, hardening of the arteries or cardiomyopathies or weakness in the heart muscle, sickle cell disease, type two diabetes. And in the next category, they, the CDC listed it as it might be at an increased risk. Um, I, I am making the assumption that they didn't feel the data was strong enough at the time that they put this out. And this is actually the revised. Um, I'm saying that to say that I would seriously think about exposing anybody with the following categories to uh, COVID. And those categories would be moderate to severe asthma, people who have um, cerebrovascular disease or problems with the blood supply to their brain, cystic fibrosis, high blood pressure, Again, any immunocompromised state, uh, neurologic conditions like dementia, liver disease, pregnancy, serious pulmonary diseases like pulmonary fibrosis, smoking, thalassemia, and type one diabetes. So if you have someone in your household or your child has one of those conditions, or you have someone in your household that's elderly, and I always smile when I have to talk about this, uh, but what is definitely shown by the data is that the older you get, the higher rate or the higher chance you have of, of um, catching COVID. And so that is to say, 
someone who is 60 has a higher chance of catching it than somebody 50. Somebody 70 has a higher risk than somebody 60. And on and on and on. The older the person, the greater the risk for them uh, for catching COVID. So in your household, you need to think about does anyone fall into these categories? And this is uh, particularly true in many, in African-American families, Hispanic families, many other minority um, ethnic groups where there may be intergenerational housing and generally larger numbers of people in one household. So that's the first thing you wanna think about. Then you want to know what is the COVID infection rate for your specific community. Now, I will say that is easier said than done. Again, uh, a direct effect from some of the um, issues with uh, how freely information is being disseminated. There are some, there are several actual actually sites that can give you uh, state level information, even county level information. But what you really want, if you can get your hands on it, is your local information. Many communities, if you Google COVID rate for whatever your community is, you will be able to pull up data sources for your local community. In some communities, there are regular reports made by either the mayor or the health department or a combination of both, giving regular COVID-19 updates for the community. And if you're in one of those communities, that's, that makes it easy for you to find the information. Um, but don't be discouraged or frustrated. Um, you should be able to get this information. The next question you wanna ask is, are the schools actually safe? And in some places, this is a major issue. The schools are old, the classrooms are small, the ventilation system is poor. Um, so it, the physical structure of the school may actually be problematic. Uh, some people have uh, suggested that do um, have classes and activities outside as much as possible. And, uh, but, and that's fine if the climate will accommodate that. And if the, where the school is, it's possible, but winter is coming for, you know, and unless you're in some very um, lucky communities, it's gonna be very difficult to have class outside in the rain and the snow. So it is a serious um, consideration, just what state are your schools, the buildings? And then you wanna find out what exactly is your school system's plan. Now, there has been all kinds of back and forth. Um, there have been governors, again, being in Florida, this is a really hot topic, where local school superintendents said, no, it's not safe for our kids to go back. And the governor said, yes, you must go back. They wound up in court. Um, I, I am very happy, very pleased that the court felt that the governor could not mandate school superintendents to open, nor could the governor withhold funding, which was the uh, stick he was holding over their heads. And this may play out in other, other localities, um, but every, everyone is talking about and making a return to school plan. So you wanna know what your local school district's plan is. How are they going to uh, achieve safe distancing? Um, are they relying on just taking that temperature as their screening tool? Is there access to rapid testing? And, um, and if it's not rapid, uh, quick um, testing so that the uh, infections can be identified, not only for the kids, but also for the school staff 
and the bus drivers. How will they achieve the, the hygiene and uh, disinfecting routines that have been recommended? Will they enforce face coverings? How are they going to handle the meals? Are you comfortable with their plan? And do you have an opportunity to discuss these plans with your school officials so that any questions that you have can be answered? What are they planning to do about transportation if transportation is an issue for you? Um, is virtual learning even an option? And if it is an option, is it one that you should consider? Is virtual learning a good option for your child? N not every child necessarily learns um, uh, in that kind of environment, but what you wanna do is find out what is the plan? Is your, learning, is your child's learning style compatible with virtual learning? If, you, if your child has, um, it, oh, most importantly, can you work while your child is not at school? Do you have access to reliable internet and devices for virtual learning use? Is someone available to supervise your child during the learning session if you're not available? Is there any opportunity for real-time live interaction with the teachers? And will your child receive a quality education through the virtual learning experience? If your child has special school-based service needs, will they be met with the virtual learning um, program? If your child has an IEP and requires special learning accomp accommodations, will these be met during the at-home learning? Can any school-based behavioral learning or nutritional services be provided in the in-home home learning environment? These are just a few of the questions that I would ask that, that I would suggest that parents um, consider. And I'm going to leave up while we take questions, uh, some recommendations for trying to control infection spread. Uh, this chart was created by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Thank you, Dr. Stevens, neighbor Stevens. I appreciate you for answering the call and giving such comprehensive information. Michelle, are there questions in the chat box? Thank you for your presentation. Um, just a few. Please explain what thalassemia is, if you would. Thalassemia is a dis disorder of the blood. It's similar to uh, sickle cell in that there is a genetic substitution for in the hemoglobin chains that results in uh, abnormal red cells. Thank you. Okay, and this one is, uh, would it be fair to say that most black households are at an increased risk because of chronic unremitting stress due to social determinants of health? I think the answer to that is an unquestionable yes. Stress exacerbates any condition that I can think of. Exactly. Okay. Well, that's it pertaining to your particular presentation. We have some general questions that you may want to jump in a little bit later. Okay. Um, let me ask a question of Dr. Neighbor Stevens. Um, your talk was so comprehensive. I'm a parent, I'm 35 years old, and I work at Starbucks. I have two children, one age five and one age 12. Tell me what my options are for school. Yes. So if your shift can be adjusted to accommodate the school uh, session and different uh, cities are doing this in different ways. In fact, I have heard conversations in some cities where they actually 
are giving evening sessions to accommodate working parents. So again, it depends on what your options are, where you, where you live. But if you can have a shift so that you can be home and keep them home and do it at home, then that would be a, um, a good option for you. Okay, I have a two part question. You mentioned that children carry a higher than usual load of COVID. Than adults, yes. It and appears that they, that they do. Is yeah. there a differential between toddlers, preteens, and adolescents in that rate of load? The caveat in my answer is that there are not a lot of children a year and less old that have been tested. But for children one to five, that, that group seems to carry the highest load and then it decreases as they get older. Okay. And the reasons are not known for why that is so. Dr. Neighbor Stevens, I'm so appreciative and happy and if it doesn't make you mad, I'm proud of you. Um, I'd like to have all of our uh, guest speakers uh, respond to uh, some of the questions. And I'd like to start off with our Surgeon General. Having heard the various presentations of Dr. Salavu and Dr. Neighbor Stevens and just from where you sit, um, what comments would you make on what the other speakers and what the questions have been uh, in terms of information to our audience, which is mostly lay, even though we have a number of physicians on the call as well? Uh, Dr. Satcher, I would invite your freeform comments. Well, um... I've been very, very impressed. And I think the presentations have been very helpful. And I certainly learned some things myself. Um, they, they were different because, uh, is it Dr. Salifu? He talked about, uh, you know, the issue of attitudes and perspectives as it relates to race and culture. And I think that's, that's very important. Um, Dr. Stevens and I go back a ways together. We worked together at Meharry, I guess, right? That's correct. We came at the same time. That's right. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm always impressed with her, and I, I thought her presentation today was outstanding. And I'm sure very helpful to parents and even grandparents like me. Um. One of the things that I'm concerned about, it's a bit outside the box of what we discussed today, but in looking at the news yesterday and today, there seem to be uh, outbreaks of counter demonstrations and caravans of supporters of the right wing or conservatism clashing with the people of black health, black lives matter, which is black health. And not to look at it too politically, but this is added stress to people of color that we don't want this to denigrate into more violence, but I would invite our speakers to address some of what may be going on and how we should react to it as health professionals. How can we be protected? You know, our official uh, moniker or name of this presentation is family preparedness and how to protect yourself during this time of COVID and hazard. And I know I'm stretching a bit, but I would definitely like uh, 
our speakers to address that because we've all got children going to school. They're going to be out. Many of us have, uh, I spoke to a physician last night uh, from Washington, D.C., in fact, who is former the director of health, public health for the city of Washington, D.C., Dr. Walks. And he was saying his son, who's at Harvard in Boston, is taller than him and darker than him. And he's very worried about his safety. I've got a young son. I'm worried about his safety. How do we address this? Any of our speakers? Well, I mean, I can address, this is, this is uh, Dr. Salik, who I can address uh, some aspect of this, but um, because the question is a very broad one and it is, it is um, way beyond what I could possibly uh, provide, but I have some, some ideas uh, on the area that I have expertise uh, and I will provide those answers. So we are dealing with uh, different aspects of uh, societal problems. One is gun violence, one is uh, police brutality. Uh, they, are, they are linked, but they are not the same problem. Um, and then we have COVID. Right, and we have to, you know, then we have a presentation and we have to send our kids back to school. And what is the best way to do that? So the part that I think we can do in terms of, you know, uh, being a medical school, being a professor, taking part in the curriculum development and all that stuff, uh, is we have to begin to look at the issue of race very differently. If you go back to the NIA gene bank and you look at the genetic analysis, we now have a gene bank and everybody can refer to the gene bank. There is no biologic, not, not significant enough to even explain anything. The biological difference between us is not there, right? So there has to be something else. So some hospitals in New York City, I know that for sure, some hospitals in New York City, they are beginning to have the conversation as to whether we should have race-based uh, research and race-based clinical care. In other words, as an example, I'm a nephrologist and then we use, uh, we use um, a formula to calculate your kidney function. It's called the estimated uh, GFR. It's a formula to calculate your kidney function and it's based on several factors including race. There is now a push to remove the race from the equation because the race disproportionately uh, underdiagnoses black people when you put the race in the equation. And some hospitals in New York City have already done that because of you know, what happened uh, with the George Floyd situation. There's now this social justice uh, situation and people are just saying, why are we thinking that there's a race issue? Why don't we treat everybody as equals? And then you have a formula for kidney functioning up. Just use it. Why do you have to adjust it for kidney, for, for race? And we had an, a conversation yesterday among the kidney specialists and we actually found out that it's actually what the, the students are saying is actually true. You know, if you actually look at it in context, there's a difference of seven points between blacks and whites when you use the formula with, uh, with, with the race in it. In other words, blacks benefit. The kidney, looks, the kidney function looks higher by seven points. But it simply means not diagnosing the disease early. That's what it simply means. But we, were, we have been using this for a long time and we didn't even know. Until these race issues began to spring, we began to analyze our own situation to see where we could have an impact. Anyway, so that's one area, uh, but there's a push to remove this race-based uh, research and then try to figure out how we can actually do research uh, that would benefit uh, more people uh, and include more people in research. Um, and I think if we were able to do that and include more people in research, we actually, especially of minority extraction into those research programs, these issues of race-based you know, health disparities uh, would actually shrink a little bit. Well, thank you, Dr. Papu. May I make a comment? Yes. It's specifically regarding how we are going to, uh, or how the involvement of these right-wing groups uh, needs to be managed. I, I for, first of all, would say that this is not something that needs to be responded to through emotion. There needs to be, and it's, and I don't really think it's rocket science. Actually, um, we need to identify the drivers of the action, 
and then focus our interventions to neutralize those actions. So what do I mean? So these uh, people that are coming in, taking advantage or attempting, I'm going to date myself and go back to my college time vocabulary, co-op the uh, activities and protests that are currently going on for their own, uh, to achieve their own end. And their end is to support who they want to support. And that person also responds to having people support them. So if I were to be asked by the Biden campaign, I would, and maybe they're already doing this, hopefully they are, um, I would create my strategy and, 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 and put into action um, conversation, uh, actions, statements that will neutralize, like putting water on the fire, extinguishing the give and take that's going on between these groups and their uh, self-claimed leader. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, you have some questions in the chat box. Sure do. Let's see, I have a question for everybody. So I'll start with Dr. Salafu. Um, would you say that the red zones that you described are equivalent to Native Americans reservations? Which would explain the similarities of some of the similar medical issues? Yeah, very similar. Um, I mean, the reservations were already known before the redlining, so that would not uh, exactly count. But but knowing that there is a lot of um, uh, disparity issues going in those areas too, of course, it counts. But it was specifically in the urban areas. The red okay. line in the urban areas in 1929, 1930, that period. Uh, and that just created these segregated communities uh, almost permanently until today. I am in Brooklyn, and if you come to Brooklyn, you can see exactly what I'm talking about. There are enclaves of this group, another enclave of that group, another enclave, and the, the populations just don't mix. And the enclaves that are, we are talking about in terms of health disparity populations are mostly African-American. In New York, it's very classic. If you map the entire New York City map, you can see it is central Brooklyn, it is Harlem, and the South Bronx. It's very clear on the map where those disparity populations are. So all the social determinants are in those populations. It's not that there are no social determinants in other populations, but they're just more concentrated in those areas because those populations were disadvantaged for more than 50 years. The redlining thing was stopped by the federal government. I have to say that though. The redlining thing was stopped by the federal government in 1970. But that is a federal law to start to not do that again. But you know, you can you know stop people from doing things. So that just continued and, and those neighborhoods just became permanent and school systems and all those systems that we think are important in bringing up people to compete in the real world are all uh, not as competitive. And that is what it is. Okay, thank you. And here's a, a layman question, which is, what is the patient's, when, in your opinion, what is the patient's recourse when bias is obvious? That is other than switching doctors. So, that is really, really a fundamental question. Uh, I commend the person who asked the question because I never even thought about that. Um, the key is for health literacy. The key is to ask questions. Let get our population ready to ask questions that are health related and then concern them directly. Hypertension, when you go to the doctor, what do you need to know and ask if you have diabetes? And we're creating those kinds of documents. If you have diabetes, just simple lay language. What do you need to know as a diabetic? Do you know, there are patients who come to me, they don't even know what A1C means and they're diabetic. They don't know what the normal blood pressure is. They know that they are hypertensive, but never, they never heard about normal blood pressure, right? They have kidney function, but they never heard about creatinine as an example the measure of your kidney function. They have heart failure, but they never heard about ejection fraction. They have asthma, but they never heard about their, you know, PFT. Just simple things and people don't know. So, uh, so, so to answer your question directly, other than changing the doctor, what do you do? Uh, if, you know, you are lucky to know a little bit, I think we have to press for more information. You have to really question and question and get more information from your doctor. And if you're not comfortable making the decision, don't make the decision. 
it has to be life and death situation to actually say, okay, doctor, go ahead. If it's not a life and death situation, I think if you're not comfortable, just seek second opinion. Let me jump in here for a moment, uh, Michelle. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sullivan. Uh, we have an affiliate organization uh, and part of his name is Second Opinion Expert. Oh, okay. And uh, we are creating an affiliate company that will contribute to the Black Health Trust. Okay. And this company will be composed of physicians such have been on this call for the past number of weeks, some internal medicine, some in all the specialties, and they will be available to members of our community for second opinions, for first opinions. And I'm inviting all of our physicians of the NMA and the ABC and across the country uh, to join us. Uh, and we'll be able to send out letters and have a website in the next week because many of our people uh, need to ask questions of people that they have a basic trust in. So it's not all developed. There's another company out there already called Second Health, Second uh, um, Expert, Second Opinion Experts uh, dot com, and uh, we've been working with them. We're going to use their proprietary software, and hopefully that will be able to address uh, some of these issues because uh, many of us have been in that position. Uh, if everybody in the country that was black wanted to see a black doctor, it couldn't be done. And we know that there are many good physicians who aren't black. But for the trust factor, we do want to uh, help this and get along. And I'm certainly going to ask uh, advice of my hero, uh, Dr. Satu, so that we go about it exactly right. And uh, also many of the people on this call. So there will be a company. Uh, it's already established. It's incorporated. I'm just waiting on the details so we can put letters out so many of our people can seek answers to those questions. Michelle, we'll go back to you. All righty. So this has to do with our children. Um, what about the stress factors for children in regards to increased risk for illness? The main factors being lack of in-person social interaction and the rapid shift to a 100% online learning system. Can you address that? This is something that has been, that is um, be, being talked about a lot especially in the pediatric world, and there's great concern about the emotional trauma that not just the Black children, but all children uh, are potentially experiencing as a result of everything that's going on this year with COVID. As with most things, and I've always said this to parents, their first, the first people that they're going to turn to for support will be the parents. So parents need to be comfortable in talking with their children about what's going on. Um, this would be true if, oh, this is also true, I shouldn't say if, this is also true as far as it goes with what's going on with all of the protests and the shootings that are so visible on TV. I'm sure there are thousands of children that have seen the videos of all of the more recent um, shootings that have occurred in this country. And there needs to be a frequent, regular conversation with children about what's going on in this country. In black families, this is not a new, should not be a new uh, practice because I had two sons and I had two daughters. And we certainly had those conversations way back when. My parents had that conversation with my brother and me. This is not a new thing. We've had a history of lynchings in this country that goes back hundreds of years. So parents, number one, are gonna have to understand and be able to talk with their children and meet them where they are in terms of their concerns. Now, if there are serious issues that develop and the parents feel that it's beyond their capability of, of addressing their children's needs, then they may in fact need to look 
for prof professional help going forward. But the first step is some heart-to-heart -heart talks with our children. Um, Thank Dr. you, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Stevens, uh, Dr. Neighbor Stevens, I get it all mixed up. Um, one of the uh, one of our associates on the phone, who happens to be my very very favorite sister, who was in charge of special education years ago for the state of Ohio, has suggested that it would be good for the Black Health Trust to have a special program periodically aimed at young people and children. And it occurs to me that much of what you're saying would support that. And hopefully uh, with you being one of our advisory board people that we could do that because I'm extremely concerned about young people. Uh, I'm not one of them, but I sure feel like one. Uh, Michelle, would you go back to the chat box? Sure, this one's directed at Dr. Satcher. Can you comment on the conflict of interest within the government with regard to the fact that the government owns the patent for Gardasil? It is approved by the FDA and regulated by the CDC. The government also makes money off of every vaccine through taxes. Should there not be an independent group of scientists to evaluate the efficacy and safety of vaccines, especially since vaccine companies cannot be sued for harm done to patients? That's not true. Well, that's really one of the most one of the most important questions, I think that's facing us, even though we haven't taken it on, uh, we have a real leadership problem uh, in the country right now. And we might as well admit that in terms of who you can trust. And uh, uh, Pre President Trump uh, has an attitude toward the truth that's sort of unusual. And it's almost as if he thinks that if he says it is true, and um, so this is a very difficult time, I think, for us. I don't know what's going to happen with the election, but I, I certainly think that we have a serious problem in terms of uh, the, the, the attitude of leadership right now and how that impacts upon everything we do. So um, I may not be answering your question directly, but I think that's the most important issue that, that, I, that we have to consider is that and the way to deal with that, of course, in my opinion, is with the election. I don't, I don't see any solution before the election, but I do believe that we've got to make sure that we do everything we can to make sure that the election results in a significant improvement in leadership um, in the country. I'm, I'm not campaigning for anybody, but I just think that as far as the nation is concerned, we do have a crisis in leadership right now. I would go so far as yeah. to say that if we don't vote in numbers and strength, we deserve exactly what we get if we don't go out and vote for the type of change that would support the health and well being of our communities of color and of our country. Michelle, are there any other questions? Sure are. So how do we get our people to participate in clinical trials when the PI doesn't look like them? And should we do more to promote clinical trials among black people? The answer is uh, yes, we should, we, should, we should encourage that. Um, I actually sent a link. Somebody asked the question as to uh, whether, you know, we have a uh, reference for the number of African-American or black physicians in the United States. And I sent the reference uh, to the chat. Uh, it's actually five to six percent. I said less than eight percent. So we, it, the number is really very low. Uh, anyway, so uh, the number of, and similarly, the number of African American patients participating in clinical trials. If you look at it overall, it's not high. It's probably you know uh, for a big study that has maybe eight thousand people, you might find maybe two hundred people will participate African Americans or thereabouts. Uh, usually around maybe you know five to ten percent African American rates in those big big clinical trials. It doesn't truly really reflect how we should use those drugs, right? Uh, in 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 clinical medicine, there was one study that uh, I actually like a lot. Um, it was done in kidney diseases, and then uh, Dr. Maxi knows the study very well. It was called the African American Study on Kidney Diseases, and um, it was a study that was designed to determine 
you know, in the past, people said, you know, if you use certain drugs, it's good for whites. And if you use those certain drugs, it's good for blacks. So the African-American blood pressure drugs. So the African-American study on it was trying to determine whether this was true, that certain drugs didn't work in African-Americans, blood pressure medications. And they were able to establish that, no, no, this, this, this is all nonsense. These same drugs that we were not using for African-Americans actually were effective in African-Americans when you actually study them in African-Americans. The reason why it, it turned out not to be effective in African-Americans was because you know, those trials that said it wasn't effective in African-Americans did not include enough African-Americans to determine the effect size. And that was where the problem is. So, so we need to participate in clinical trials for that reason so that uh, more of the biologic differences will be dispelled. Uh, the next question was, how do you participate if the person doing the trial doesn't look like you? At this point, that's a challenge because only 5% of us actually are in those uh, trials. Uh, that is a big challenge. But um, we will still go ahead and say that, you know, uh, read the consents properly. We still want the science out there. We encourage people to participate, read the consents. And if you don't feel comfortable, of course, you don't participate. But most of the studies, all the IRBs in major academic medical centers will actually protect the patients. That I'm almost certain about. The academic medical centers will protect the patients. So if you're not sure, uh, you contact the IRB, the Institutional Review Board, and then they will explain more of the study to you. Uh, but I can almost certainly say that if the study is coming from an academic medical center, I don't think there's, there's usually a major problem in terms of protecting the subject. Dr. Talifu, I want you to address the question, if you would, of the ACE2 receptor. Yes. Uh, and your thoughts on that and the, uh, as the entry point okay. of uh, COVID and yeah. Even more importantly, many of our people are on ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blocking agents as treatments for right. high blood pressure. Can you wow. elucidate is, this? I actually wrote a paper on this subject uh, just as to when the COVID was uh, the peak of the pandemic in the second week in April. I brought my team together. I said, look, we have to explain to people how this disease actually works because nobody knows. So I put a team of people in my office, I locked them up a little bit and said, think, all right, get the answers out. And we're actually able to come out with the pathophysiology of how the COVID actually causes all these problems. And it's published in the International Journal of Research. I will send the link into the chat and anyone who wants to read the, uh, the article can read it. It's very explained, it's nicely explained diagrams of how this works. Anyway, this is how it works. COVID-19 has what we call the spike proteins. If you look at CNN, they will show this big little, you know, virus with a lot of spikes, the red, red, you know, things in the circle. Those are called spike proteins, right? Um, and the, the, the COVID spike protein one, the first one, binds to the lung cells through uh, virus receptors. But the, the one that it binds the most is called the ACE2 receptor. So the ACE2 receptor is called the angiotensin tensin converting enzyme type two receptor. That is the receptor on the surface of the lung cells. So COVID comes, binds to ACE2, then the cell then takes the ACE2 and the COVID all together into the cell. And then the cell now has the COVID, it's like it swallowed the COVID and the enzyme, right? The, the receptor. So the COVID now has all the elements it needs to now start growing inside the cell and then blow up the cell. But what it does is that the more it absorbs the ACE2 into, ACE, into the cell, the more you have less ACE2 on the surface of the cell. The reason why there's ACE2 on the cell is because there's a reason for that. The ACE2 is what counteracts the ACE1 and balances your blood pressure. Usually, blood pressure goes up when your angiotensin 1 goes up and your ACE2 levels go, ACE1 levels go up. So the ACE2 is the one that balances the two and keeps your blood pressure under control. So if you lose your ACE2 because the COVID is taking away the ACE2 into the cells, you have an unbalanced ACE1 action and you become very hypertensive. So a lot of the COVID patients actually are hypertensive, sort of hypotensive. When we have patients who are very sick, their blood pressure drops. The COVID patient, the blood pressure goes up for that reason. So the question was, uh, what does that do to the, to the vessel, the, the blood vessel? What it does to the blood vessel is that when the blood pressure goes up and you lose your ACE2, the blood vessel now becomes very damaged. 
because of the blood pressure issue. And then it begins to you know, form clots. And that's one of the pathology of the COVID. It forms clots in the lungs. And that is why these patients are short of breath and they don't look sick, but they're short of breath and the saturation is very low. And you're wondering, but you're looking good. The patient's talking to you and you tell, look, I'm going to get, get ready. I'm going to put the tube in your throat. And I say, you're going to put the truth in my stuff? And they say, yes. They, they look good, but they can crash in one second because there's a disconnect. The problem is not the pneumonia. The problem is that this ACE2 is disconnected. All the blood vessel regulation goes away and now it becomes a thrombus within the blood vessel itself. So it's a blood vessel problem, clotting in the lungs, okay? So now there is, uh, there is, there is now the, um, uh, you know, you have to antagonize that. So that's what Dr. Maxi was getting to. So we have unopposed, ACE2, go, when the cell is gone, ACE1 is unopposed. So potentially the treatment for COVID could be ACE inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, like captopril, inaropril, lisinopril, all those blood pressure medication. Technically, if you use that to block the ACE1, you can reduce the vessel damage, reduce the blood vessel inflammation, and then the clotting that goes around it. And then all you have is just the infection itself, but not the clots. Thank you. That was very, very good. Uh, I've been wondering about a lot of that for a long time. Uh, I have a question or a comment for Dr. Satcher. Uh, some weeks ago, we had the deputy police chief of the Los Angeles Police Department on, and we were talking about uh, police brutality. And we came to a conclusion that we needed to get more of our young black men and women to become part of the police department and especially to police our neighborhoods. Given Dr. Salafu's comments on the paucity of black physicians, male and female, when I was working with your colleague, Dr. Lewis Sullivan, we determined that there were less than 100 male black physicians in all of the medical schools in the country combined. That was a few years ago in 2003 and four. As an academician, what is the current level of male physicians in that pool and how can we encourage a greater number of people to go into profession of medicine, Dr. Satchi? Well, the first thing I will say is that um, I haven't seen the figures for this year, but last year, the number of black males enrolling in medical school was less than it was in 1978. Wow. That, and, that, and our president here talks about that all the time. She's involved in a major effort, WMC, to increase black male enrollment. So we have a very serious problem. And I'm sure it starts in junior high school. Uh, the graph I was showing in terms of mortality ratios, um, I think that has impacted uh, you know, all of our areas of endeavor in this country and certainly black males uh, because of dropout from junior high school, because of incarceration all those things really reflected in that in that particular graph is, in, is really hurting us right now in terms of worrying about getting more black males into medicine. So this institution has decided that we've got to be involved from the beginning. And so we have a special program here for parents. We call it quality parenting in terms of working with parents around how do we uh, maximize opportunities for children from the beginning, including pregnancy. Because uh, unless we look at it from the beginning, I don't think we're gonna have, at least not soon anyway, we're not gonna have a significant impact. Uh, let me expand that one minute. I was uh, the director of a program when I was in medical school in the College of Dentistry, the program was called Academic Reinforcement. And we would have 50 students and we were able to admit 21 of them after a summer of classes. 
to the freshman class of the College of Dentistry. The main takeaway I had from doing the testing, even though many of these students were uh, quite brilliant, their main deficit was reading comprehension. They were college graduates, but they still had poor reading comprehension. And I believe that is something that we have to address with our young black students, especially males. Uh, and there's even some social pressure for young men not to read, not to spend their time doing that. Um, and as I see the face of uh, Michelle, I, I think about her two brilliant young men. But I think that's a, a problem of reading comprehension, early thoughts that academia is not bad. Uh, how, would, how can we do some of that, uh, Dr. Satcher and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, neighbor St uh, Stevens and Dr. Salafu? And then we'll go back to the chat box. Well, again, I, I think it starts with quality parenting. And I think there are a lot of parents who need our support and also welcome our support. Um, the, the rule here is that Every student at the Tuskegee Academy, which is the um, elementary junior high school close to us, every student has a tutor from the Morehouse School of Medicine. So that's, that's something that we've committed to, to try to do everything we can to help these students as early as possible. When it comes to test taking, you know, writing, comprehension, things like that. So I, number one, we have to admit that we have a very serious problem and it calls for a very serious uh, response. And uh, nobody has done a, a, a technical evaluation of the Tuskegee Academy study. The school is not that far from here. I'm looking at my assistant Yvonne, who is one of the tutors of students at Tuskegee Academy. But it's a commitment that we've made because we can talk about the problem, you know, all we want, but we've got to make a commitment to what each of us is willing to do to try to impact it. And at the Satchel Leadership Institute, of course, we have the quality parenting program from which we've graduated, I think about 70 parents now. And uh, obviously it remains to be seen the impact that that makes over a period of time but I think, I think we're challenged to do something that could make a significant difference. Thank you. Dr. Neighbor Stevens? Can you unmute Dr. Neighbor Stevens? Simon, can you unmute? Okay. I think I'm unmuted now. Okay. I, I certainly um, agree with everything that Dr. Satcher said, but I'd like to take it to another level and suggest that we as a community who recognize that there is no white knight, black knight or purple knight that's gonna save us. We're gonna to have to save ourselves. And we have the capacity within our community to save ourselves. We have done it in the past and we can do it again. There are many local groups that have tutoring programs um, that they carry on. I'm talking about our Greek organizations. I'm talking about links. I'm talking about school uh, churches that have after school programs and summer enrichment programs to help our children with their scholastic skills. There are many um, medical societies that have mentoring and scholastic enrichment programs at different levels, whether we're talking about elementary, middle, high, high school, or college across the country. We need more of that. We need more support of that, as well as encouraging other institutions, other um, organizations to take up this whole effort around tutoring and scholastic enrichment because we don't have a lot of kids in college 
So we're not gonna have a lot of black kids in medical school. We need to start working with them at the pre-K level and bring them all, support them all the way up. And as a community, we're, just, we're gonna have to commit ourselves to taking that on to a greater degree than we are currently doing. Um, thank you, Dr. Neighbor Stevens. Uh, Michelle, while we wait for our speakers to give a last round of comments and thoughts, uh, let's take two more questions before we close out, if there are any in the chat box. Okay, uh, I'll go with a practical question. Uh, might use of an oximeter be more indicate, in, indicative of COVID uh, than taking temperatures? I can answer that. that. Um, it is, disease happens in stages. So you are catching different stages of the disease, right? So uh, the stage at which the disease is mostly upper respiratory uh, can be caught by the temperature, whereas your saturation is very uh, preserved. And as the disease goes down into your lungs and causes more problems, you're going to have both the temperature and then the saturation issue. So, so it has to do with at, at what point in the process, the cycle, uh, you have actually present. Uh, so if, if you're using the temperature alone, it's not enough. And if you're using the, uh, the saturation alone, it's not enough. Uh, I think we have to employ both. Okay. And then... Um... We'll go with this one. Um, it comes with a disclaimer and it says, sorry to have to ask you this, but since the CDC omitted from 2010 report that a study showed that vaccines were associated with a 250 to 350% increase in the incident of autism in young black males vaccinated up through the age of 36 months brought forth by CDC scientist, William Thompson, how can we trust the CDC about anything? Well, I, I'm, I guess I would probably have a conflict of interest because that issue came up when I was uh, director. And it's interesting, Dr. Mays, Dr. Benjamin Mays' niece, who many of you know, directs that program at the CDC. And um, Is that Marcelin? That's right. Marshall and Jurgen. Yep. And she's written about this issue. So, so I think uh, most people would say that... Um, the, the evidence to support um, that is not good, uh, that vaccines increase autism by that extent. I, mean, I know that's a big issue now and that it's been argued from both sides. Uh, we know the value of vaccines. We certainly do. We, that's the reason we don't have any smallpox. It's the reason Africa no longer has any polio. And hopefully in time, Polio will be eradicated. So um, I, I don't think the evidence is good in terms of the relationship between vaccines and autism. Thank you, Dr. Satcher. Let's let's do one more, and then let's go do a round of comments from our speakers. Is there one more question? Sure. Uh, do you have any suggestions for what we as Black healthcare professionals can do to influence the better handling of this pandemic? since the black community is heavily impacted. Any suggestions for what we as the black health professionals can do to influence the better handling of this pandemic? I want to make a question for everybody, all of our speakers. Dr. Stephen. I was just gonna say that um, there is the local and state level of impact, and then there's the federal level of impact. And the Florida State Medical Association, which is the state affiliate of NMA in Florida, has been very active uh, in attempting to make the state responsive to the needs of the African-American um, community, including um, sending a letter and requesting a meeting with the Florida Surgeon General and Head of Public Health to an op-ed writing campaign in local um, cities, as well as several of the city uh, local societies wrote proposals trying to get, um, and, and two have been successful so far in getting uh, grants from the CARES money to do uh, local uh, programs to benefit the African-American community. So my point is you can look for 
opportunities and jump on them at your local and state level and then work collaboratively with other um, groups in letting um, our opinion known at the federal level. NMA, I'm, as uh, was mentioned in my introduction, I am chair of the Council on Medical Legislation for National Medical Association. And we try as best we can with, you know, everybody's got day jobs too, but we try as best we can to review all of the legislation that is being proposed that uh, affects um, from a medical uh, point of view um, and provide our responses to the sponsor um, regarding what we think about the bill. And we do sign on and uh, support those that we think are advantageous. So as an organization, we're trying to make an impact on policy. Um, but then all of us, again, going back to the vote, we gotta vote. We gotta, we gotta worry about the up ballot and we gotta worry about the down ballot. All of it needs to be taken very seriously. Well, thank you. While our speaker is prepared to give a final comment, I wanna remind people what we say every week. This is a time to prepare your family. We're under siege in a way. You should make sure that you have adequate supplies, uh, food that is non-perishable. Uh, be prepared for two to three weeks of quarantine should that happen. We also want to continue to be clean, wash hands. I tend to wash my hands every time I think about it. Plain old soap and hot water is better than even the hand sanitizers. After you wash your hands, hand sanitizer is good. Be careful of where you get it. There have been reports that some people have put out hand sanitizer with methyl alcohol, which is very detrimental to your health. So watch your sources of hand sanitizer. We also recommend that nutrition is extremely important uh, especially your micronutrients uh, that you can get from green leafy vegetables. Usually a handful of kale or spinach is about five milligrams of, uh, of good antioxidants. They have what we call nitric oxide in them, which will help your immune system. Barring that, I'm not pregnant the last time I looked, but I do take prenatal vitamins, which contain most of the micronutrients. I also take two grams of vitamin C a day. And we recommend, especially for those of color, initially 50,000 units per week of vitamin D3. You can lower it after we know that there's some potential toxic effects, but of course, check with your physician. It's also so been recommended that people use selenium uh, as a part of their diet and zinc. And we know that zinc is toxic to many viruses and can have an effect. Having said this, uh, our program for next week is going to include Dr. Mitchell, Edith Mitchell, who is uh, Chair of Oncology or Cancer Medicine at Jefferson College in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, and she also is the editor of the Journal of the National Medical Association. Uh, and we also are expecting to have Dr. Keith Black, who is a world-class neurosurgeon uh, and chief of the Department of Neurosurgery at Cedars Sinai Hospital here in Los Angeles. And I'm also uh, have invited a Dr. Carter, who is a noted doctor of functional medicine. And we've had previous doctors of functional medicine who are going to really speak about the issues of nutrition. And I had a conversation yesterday with several functional medicine doctors talking about uh, the controversy of hydroxychloroquine and whether or not it is affected by the use of zinc and what it does. And we're going to present in a credible way that. So I ask you to return next week and be a part of what we're doing. I salute 
and appreciate all of our speakers today. I'm gonna to ask each of you to make a brief final comment as we're at our time of uh, closing this call. I'll start uh, with uh, Dr. Satcher. And Dr. Satcher, you've always been our hero and we appreciate your service to the nation as our top health officer. And uh, you and I are both of the age group. We need to stay locked up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. I'll be very brief. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's been great being with you. It's been very um, informative. And I commend you for, for the program that you have going here. So thank you. And I've enjoyed being with you. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Dr. Sanford. I truly appreciate the invitation. Um, I really appreciate the audience as well and the questions that came to the chat. My final comments would be that uh, implicit simply means that the person is not aware uh, of what is going on. So the person actually making the decisions about treatment, uh, treatment which may actually not be favorable to one group actually is not aware. That's why we call it implicit bias. Uh, they have implicit stereotypes, they have implicit bias, they are doing it without knowing it. Um, so we have to just be vigilant to make sure that uh, healthcare professionals know about this. We need to make sure that patients know about this so that uh, at each level, we all contribute to the solution to make sure that the biases are not, and the prejudices are not influencing care. I appreciate the invitation again. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Dr. Barbara Neighbor Stevens. Thank you again for inviting me. I am so honored to be among some of the greats and um, I would always respond to my teacher uh, when called upon, my final words would be to the audience, stay woke. This is a moving target. Stay up to date on the information that is available and that pertains to you locally as well as nationally and use uh, good, accurate information uh, to guide your behavior and your decisions. Well, thank you. Uh, if and Lyle, uh, would you tell people we need donations again before we close? Or Michelle? Okay. Yes, we asked you to please visit blackhealthtrust.org and make a donation. We hope that this information has been helpful to you. Please visit our website also to look at past episodes of the program for additional information. And we look forward to your support. Thank you, blackhealthtrust.org. Thank you. And lastly, uh, is Ms. Brenda Lee Ager on to close us out? I'm here. Okay. okay. Please close this out in your usual okay. way. Okay. Keep your head to the sky. Giving thanks for this day and for this wonderful awareness that we are being given by our wonderful, wonderful physicians and leaders of health and science in this country. We're so blessed. And I just give thanks for Mother, Mother, Father, God, and how great thou art to bring us together and make us all aware of your goodness and your mercy and your truth. This is the time and these are the people we've been waiting for. We are the change. And for this, watching over everybody's families, wherever we are in all parts of the world, I give thanks until our next meeting. And so it is, and so I let it be. Amen. Enjoy. Amen. Amen. Have a good day, everybody. And thank, thank you, you Miss Brenda. God bless everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.